Welcome to Into the Word, a four-year chronological journey through each verse of the Bible in 30-minute daily lessons. Our host and Bible teacher is Thomas J. Short, who serves as the minister for Elkhart Christian Church in Elkhart, Indiana. Each episode of Into the Word is made available daily at 5 a.m. wherever you get your favorite audio podcasts, and is made available in a visual format on YouTube. As well, all show archives are hosted at www.intotheword2020.com where you can also sign up for a daily email reminder. However you listen, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons, and give the today's episode a rating and some feedback in the comments section. Or, send us an email at intotheword at resermon.com. We always appreciate listener feedback and engagement. The objective of studying God's Word is to know God better, and that journey begins through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Look for more information about this in the show notes, or listen for more information at the end of this show. Today, we're in Season 5, Episode number 518 and we're studying 2 Kings 21 and 22, and 2 Chronicles 33 and 34, and we're studying the repentance of Manasseh, the sins of Ammon, and the rise of Josiah. So now, let's get a pen, a notebook, and a Bible and get into the Word. Into the Word is produced by Re Sermon, on the web at www.resermon.com. In our studies of the southern kingdom of Judah, we have been watching the ratcheting downward of this kingdom into its final sin and judgment. We know that King Uzziah, who reigned for 52 years, was a good and godly king for 50 of those years. And then suddenly, he got it in his head that he should be allowed to act as a priest in the temple and offer incense. And he insisted that he should be able to do that. And he was stricken with leprosy and spent the last two years of his reign living in a house away from everyone else. His son was a good and godly man, Jotham. And he tried to be like his father in his best years. But unfortunately, his son... Ahaz was not a good and godly man, and he shoved his father to the side and took charge of the kingdom and began to lead it into sin and dependence upon ungodly nations, and judgment began to fall on the kingdom of Judah, until finally Ahaz was dead and buried And his son, Hezekiah, came to the throne. And Hezekiah was a good and godly man. In fact, he is listed in Scripture as being the greatest of all the kings of southern Judah. And he removed all of the pagan worship sites and all of the idols that his father Ahaz had brought into the nation and into the city of Jerusalem. And he rededicated the temple, and he had a great revival break out, uh, which pushed even into northern Israel, giving some of the people up there one last chance to repent and re-embrace the true and living God before judgment fell on that northern kingdom. But once Hezekiah died, he was replaced by his son Manasseh, the longest ruling king in the kingdom of Judah. He reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. And unfortunately, the majority of those years was as a pagan king. He reversed everything all the things that his father Hezekiah had done. And and, uh, Manasseh brought paganism to the forefront in the southern kingdom and even brought the worship of Baal and Asherah into the temple complex itself. And God judged him by allowing him to be captured by the Assyrians and taken away to Babylon, where he faced a lifetime of exile. But thankfully, he repented, and he cried out in that genuine repentance for mercy from God, and God brought him back to Jerusalem and let him live out the remainder of his years trying to reverse all the evil things that he'd done. 
and he got many of them taken care of. He got rid of all the pagan altars and idols out of the temple and out of Jerusalem and out of Judea. But the moment he was dead, his son Ammon, an unrighteous man, began to undo all of that good in the late years of his father. And even though he only ruled for two years before he was assassinated, Ammon brought Judah back into paganism. And that's where our story picks up with his son, Josiah. If you would turn to 2 Chronicles 34, verse 1, we have here the outline of the formative years of Josiah's kingdom. Uh, The parallel, by the way, is in 2 Kings 22. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 31 years in Jerusalem. So you can tell already that he's not going to be all that old when he dies, and his kingdom comes to an end prematurely. But the year that he came to power, by my estimation, is 640 B.C. And because of his young age, it is likely that during those first few years of his life, the decisions of the kingdom were done by the advisors of his father, Ammon. And so paganism remained in place. The idols remained in the temple The worship altars remained in Jerusalem to the gods and the goddesses of the Middle East. But then, as Josiah grew up, things began to change. Verse 2 says, He did what was right in the eyes of he who is, and he walked in the ways of David his father, and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, when he was yet a boy... So that would be 633 B.C. Josiah would have been about 15 years of age. That year on the Israeli calendar, according to my calculations, happened to be the 112th sabbatical year. And because it was the 112th, then it would have been followed by the 16th year of Jubilee. And the pragmatical situation that arises from that is two years the Israeli people, the Judean people, took off from their normal work. One year for the sabbatical year and another year for the year of Jubilee. Those years were spent in rest and relaxation, uh, catching up with family and friends and celebrating, but there was also reflection thinking about the God who created all things, the God who brought Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land and gave them this cycle of six years of work, followed by a year off, followed by seven cycles and a 50th year of time off. And people reflected on their relationship with God during those years. And I believe that's exactly what happened to Josiah. People around him who loved God had planted seeds in him of who the true and living God was that he owed his allegiance to. And so he began to seek God in that eighth year. And then, verse 3 continues, in the twelfth year, He began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim, the carved, and the metal images. The twelfth year of Josiah would have been 628 B.C. I believe the spring is what we're thinking about right here. He would have been right around 20 years of age, which in Israeli traditional terms, that is majority age. That's adulthood. And so this would have been the time that he would have asserted his kingship 
and pushed aside all of those holdovers from his wicked father's administration. He decided it is time for Judah to serve the true and living God. And all of these gods and goddesses have got to go. The details of that can be found over in 2 Kings 23, starting at verse number 4. 2 Kings 23, 4. The king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of he who is all the vessels made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the host of heaven. So, Josiah tells the high priest, who, we've got to acknowledge this, had allowed all of this paganism to continue over the last few years since Ahaz, the last wicked king, was gone. He allowed these things to stay there. And so Josiah tells this older man, I want you to do the right thing. Get that junk out of God's house. Take out all the worship items of Baal, all the worship items of Asherah, and all the worship items of all the other gods and goddesses of the Middle East out of God's temple. Verse continues, he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. So he has all of this paganized junk burned up and whatever was left uh, from all of that destruction, he has them taken north to the city of Bethel uh, where he's going to do something else ceremonious. Verse 5, he deposed the priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to make offerings in the high places at the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem, those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and the moon and the constellation and all the host of heaven. So he has all the pagan priests inside his kingdom gotten rid of. Verse 6, he brought out the Asherah from the house of he who is outside Jerusalem to the brook Kidron and burned it in at the brook Kidron and beat it to dust and cast the dove or the dust upon the graves of the common people. So he has the great big totem pole or possibly a living tree that was in the courtyard of the temple of God, but this totem or this tree was devoted to the queen of heaven, the goddess of fertility, the goddess of grain uh, for the Middle Eastern pagans. He has that chopped down, taken out, cut up even more, destroyed until it's nothing but dust, and then he has it scattered around a graveyard, which was already considered unclean. And so that's how he disposes of it. Verse 7, he broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes who were in the house of he who is where the women wove hangings for Asherah. And uh, these would be uh, these would be priests, men, who offered themselves sexually to worshipers, both male and female, that wanted to worship um, either Baal or Asherah, in a very intimate fashion. Uh, sexual interaction was unfortunately a part of much of the paganism, paganism of the past. And so he gets rid of the brothel that was actually inside the temple complex uh, and uh, gets that gotten rid of and all the people that were part of that. Verse 8, he brought out... The all the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had made offerings from Geba to Beersheba. So he gets rid of everything pagan all around his 
uh, immediate capital city area. He broke down the high places of the gates that were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on the on one's left at the gate of the city. Uh, however, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of he who is in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brothers. Now, some of these high places that we're talking about here were actually devoted to the true and living God. And we've talked about this before, that during some of the periods of time when bad kings were in charge and the temple had become a place devoted to paganism, godly people continued their worship at high places around the kingdom of Judah. Now, that was not the ideal situation. There was supposed to be one altar at the temple building where everybody came to worship. And so Josiah, because he is completely committed to this idea of getting rid of all paganism in his kingdom, he says all of that scattered worship of the true and living God needs to be refocused back to the temple of Jerusalem where it belongs. So he shuts down all of the alternate worship sites for he who is. And uh, those priests that were helping people worship at those different sites, they were brought back to Jerusalem. They're not allowed by Josiah to actively worship um, as priests at the temple. That is, they can't offer sacrifices, they can't uh, burn incense, because I guess in his mind, they had violated their oaths by worshiping at other sites. But he does allow them to be assisting priests and get their payment of food and drink and clothing allowances and things like that at Jerusalem. Uh, verse number 10, he defiled Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no one might burn his son or his daughter as an offering to Molech. Now, the valley of Hinnom is uh, on the southern side of Jerusalem. It feeds into the Kidron Valley just south of the southern tip of the ancient city of David, the ancient city of Jerusalem, uh, just a little bit south of the Pool of Siloam. And this valley had become a place where Molech, also known as Chemosh, was worshipped. This is the god of the Moabites and the Ammonites uh, who came into existence after the um, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah by God. And the reason that the Moabites and Ammonites came into existence is through incest, uh, through getting drunk and getting pregnant. And so the way they worshipped their god, Molech, which is just a, a rephrasing of the word king, and Chemosh, which is just another way of saying destruction, uh, the way they worshipped this deity was they would get drunk and intentionally impregnate women. The babies born from those women would then be devoted to destruction, that is to be burned alive at the next time that the ceremony took place. And so this is called passing through the fire. And uh, the kings of Judah, some of them had actually done this. Manasseh had burned at least two of his sons uh, in this fashion. So here is Josiah saying, I'm shutting that down. I am defiling this place called Tophet. Uh, Tophet is a, a word that means to strike the hand drum, you know, uh, uh, like a tambourine without the jingles. And it has a, a sound to it. Tof, 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 tof. And so tofit was a plural of that. And so that's probably a reference to the drumming place. But it's also related to a Hebrew word that means to spit in derision uh, or judgment. So uh, just like that is a tof. Uh, so this tofit place uh, becomes an Old Testament symbol for hell, 
the final place of judgment, and it's associated with fire. Uh, and that's why the Valley of the Son of Hinnom eventually comes into the Greek language to mean the same thing. The word for valley is gar, and uh, Hinnom becomes Hinnon in uh, later Greek, and so gar Hinnom becomes Gehenna, which is the common word in Greek for hell, the place of eternal judgment by fire. Uh, I explain that now because that will come up in some prophecies later, and then when we get to the New Testament, uh, we'll talk about it again. So, Josiah is the one that shuts that nonsense down in the valley of hell uh, and won't allow it to happen during the rest of his reign. Verse 11, he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of he who is by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the precincts, and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. The pagan peoples of the Middle East, just like the Greeks later, believed that the sun was a god that mounted a chariot of fiery horses every morning in the east and flew across the sky and then finally ended up in the West. And so someone amongst the kings of Judah had decided to worship the sun god by having perhaps a full-scale um, image of this sun god chariot and horses uh, made and placed at the entrance to God's temple. And Josiah has had enough, and he will not allow that to remain in place. And so he has it burned. Verse number 12, And the altars on the roof of the upper chamber of Ahaz, remember that's his dad, uh, excuse me, his great-granddad, uh, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars that Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of he who is, he pulled down and broke in pieces and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. So the things that were placed and then removed and replaced and then removed and then replaced again, he has them finally removed and destroyed out there in the Kidron Valley on the east side of the city of Jerusalem. Verse 13, the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem to the south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Ashtaroth, the abomination of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. This goes all the way back to Solomon. Remember, Solomon's heart was turned away from God by his pagan wives. And he had compromised with them at the beginning of his relationship with them by allowing them to build their worship altars to their pagan gods and goddesses on the southern slopes of the Mount of Olives, immediately east of ancient Jerusalem. Uh, this place is now uh, the uh, Palestinian city of Silwan, and it uh, has an awful lot of ancient tombs that had been located there uh, after the time of Josiah. Uh, but... In the time of Solomon, up to the time of Josiah, it was a suburb of Jerusalem. It was a paganized suburb of Jerusalem where these uh, foreign gods and goddesses had been worshipped. And so it is Josiah that destroys that worship site. Verse 14, and he broke in pieces the pillars and cut down the Asherim and filled their places with the bones of men. And the way he did it was he uh, desecrated those places with dead body parts. And that's why in the histories that followed, that area became a cemetery. Verse 15, 
Moreover, the altar at Beth Ale, the high place erected by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. You remember when at the death of Solomon, the northern kingdom split off and Jeroboam became the first king of that northern kingdom. And he was, a, he was worried that people would keep coming to the Jerusalem temple and he would eventually lose them uh, and even lose his kingdom. So he builds golden calves to represent he who is. And he puts one of them at Bethel, just a few miles north of the border. And so that place became and remained for a very long time a major worship site in the northern kingdom of Israel. Well, now Bethel is under Josiah's control. And so he goes up there and uh, that altar with the high place, he pulled down and burned, reducing it to rust. Uh, to dust. He also burned the Asherah. And as Josiah turned, he saw the tombs that were on the mountain. You know, cemeteries popped up around worship sites, even pagan ones. People wanted to be buried near the holy site that uh, that they worshiped at. And so he sees these tombs near where he's destroying this altar. He sent and took the bones out of those tombs, and he burned them on the altar and defiled them according to the word of he who is that the man of God proclaimed who had predicted these things on the day that that altar was dedicated by Jeroboam. An unnamed prophet said that a later king named Josiah would defile this place by burning the body parts of these uh these prophets, or excuse me, these uh, priests on that altar. And so here's Josiah fulfilling that prophecy many hundreds years later. Then he said, what's this monument that I see? And the men of the city told him, "Um, it's the tomb of the man of God who predicted these things. Uh, He came to Judah and predicted these things, or from Judah and predicted these things uh, that you've done against the altar at Bethel. And he said, well, let him be. Let no man move his bones. And so they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came out of Samaria. So he shows respect for those that were involved in predicting what he's doing. Verse 19, And Josiah removed all the shrines also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which kings of Israel had made, provoking he who is to anger. He did them according to all that he'd done at Bethel, And he sacrificed all the priests of the high places who were there on the altars and burned human bones on them. And then he returned to Jerusalem. So he is asserting himself as the king to bring Israel back to the true worship of the true God. And we will find out tomorrow that this young king was joined by a young prophet that was given a similar responsibility by God. Thank you for joining us today on Into the Word. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and will join us again tomorrow through our four-year chronological journey through each verse of God's Word, the Bible. For more information visit www.intotheword2020.com or email intotheword at resermon.com. The point of studying the Bible is to get to know the author of the Bible, God Himself. The Bible is God's revelation of Himself to mankind and culminates in the life and ministry of His one and only Son, Jesus of Nazareth, the prophesied Messiah. So, what does it take to begin a relationship with God, and what does Jesus have to do with that relationship? Please check the show notes to access some resources that we have prepared for you. Or, visit www.intotheword2020.com. Again, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.